Hi guys, so we're going to do a quick video on the sources of energy in coastal environments. Um, we're going to look at wind, waves, constructive and destructive, tides, currents and low energy and high energy coasts. OK, so you'll see that wind is highlighted throughout the video, and that's because wind is such a fundamentally important source of energy uh, into the coastal system. So really, it's the major input of energy in the coastal system, and it links very strongly with other sources of energy on that list, such as waves. It's also important to remember that wind can um, determine transport of sediment, the direction that the wind is blowing from, so the prevailing wind will determine where transported sediment moves via longshore drift. So wind and waves just go hand in hand, and that's because wind causes waves. So when wind blows across the surface of the sea, it causes ripples. This is because of friction between the wind and the water. Close to the coast, horizontal movement of water occurs as waves are driven onshore. A bit of a link back to some GCSE knowledge, just to remind ourselves of these key terms. When water rushes up the beach, we call it swash, and when it flows back down, we call it backwash. Now, there are three factors that determine the size of waves. The first one is the strength of the wind, and you know, make, pretty obviously, um, the, the stronger the wind, the, the larger, the more powerful waves we are going to get. That's determined by the pressure gradient, which is the pressure difference between two places. So winds blow from high to low pressure. Where there is a large difference between the high and the low pressure, we get the stronger wind. The second factor would be the length of time that the wind blows for. So again, pretty obviously, the longer the wind blows for, the more powerful and the larger the waves uh, we will see. And then the third factor is fetch. That's the distance of open water over which the wind blows. Now, the longer the fetch, again, the more powerful the waves we're going to see. The longest fetch in the UK is over 3,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean to Brazil. And that's why in the, the southwest of the UK, we get powerful waves. And that's why lots of people like going surfing in Cornwall. And staying with waves, there are two different types. And wind, Let's just quickly recap is the main source of energy here. It's driving the waves. But then depending on the type of wave that we get at particular coastlines, um, these features will affect uh, the coastline in different ways. So if we have a constructive wave, we're going to see a strong swash and a weak backwash. So these are waves that build up the beach. They have a long wavelength compared to a low wave height. If you have a look at the diagram on the left, you can see that clearly. So they look like gently kind of undulating waves. They're created in calm weather. They are associated with deposition of sand on the beach. So as I've said before, they are building the beach. And they are associated with a gentle beach profile. Although over time, they will build up the beach and make it steeper. The second type of wave is a destructive wave. Nice kind of clear, uh, clear word there, destructive. It helps us remember what these waves generally do to the coastlines that they impact. So here we've got the opposite. We have a weak swash, but a strong backwash. That is going to be pulling material from the beach back down into the sea. Again, opposite to constructive, these waves have a short wavelength, but they are high and steep. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that they are created in storm conditions. They break downwards with great force 
and are much more frequent than constructive waves. And they are associated with a steeper beach profile. But again, over time, they will flatten the beach due to their destructive nature. And there's just a couple of pictures here to uh, see these in real life. So at the top on the left, we've got our gentle, uh, very flat, uh, long, uh, constructive waves. And then on the bottom right hand side, you can see quite a clear difference with a destructive wave in this picture. Higher height, you can see them breaking down with great force, um, a steeper beach profile. Um, and you can see the impact that those waves are having on this particular coastline. OK, so that's wind and waves. Um, and moving on to another source of energy, although these are still completely tied to wind and waves, uh, we look at tides and currents. Now, coastal areas experience two high and two low tides every lunar day, which is just over 24 hours. I think it's 24 hours and 50 minutes. Now, tides are changes in the water level of seas and oceans. And they're caused by gravitational pull of the moon and to a lesser extent, the sun. So actually the gravitational pull of, of the moon and the sun actually are another um, kind of input of energy here. Now there's a few key terms that we need to be aware of. We've got, first of all, where the sea surface rises to its highest point, we refer to this as high tide. And at the lowest point, this is low tide. And then the difference between high and low tide is called tidal range. And depending on what these tides um, are, are like at the coast, if we've got very high or low, if we have the low or high tidal range, then they will impact the coastline in different ways. Tidal currents transport large quantities of, of sediment and they may erode. And the rise and fall of the tide distributes wave energy across a shore zone by changing the depth of water and the position of the shoreline. So tides and tidal currents can have a big impact on the coastline. We need to go into a little bit more detail around tides by just taking a step back and thinking about how they actually form. So I've said already, that the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun are responsible for tides. So we need to be aware of two types of tide. And they relate to what the position of the moon and the sun in relation to each other and to the Earth. So first of all, we have neap tides. Now, we get these tides which have a small tidal range when the moon um, is at right angles to the sun. And during this time, it means that the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun act against each other. And we see a small tidal range within that period. The other type of tide we get is called a spring tide. And, and you can see from my very well drawn diagram um, that this is when the sun and the moon are in line. So in this sense, gravitational pulls of the moon and the sun act together. And that gives us a large tidal range because we're seeing higher high tides and lower low tides. Now, what does this mean? Well, the tidal range will determine the height and the duration of wave processes. And if you think about it, think about when you've been stood at the, the seaside um, and you've seen the tides coming in and out. Um, tides will increase the rate of coastal erosion. Obviously, there's other factors here like geology um, and what the landscape actually looks like. Um, but in general, they will increase the rate of coastal erosion. And when we have a low tidal range, 
so around the neap tides, we have a reduction in wave energy and we might see uh, cliff faces uh, less affected by marine processes. So somewhere like in the Mediterranean, we have a low tidal range generally. And so we see a, a lower um, kind of uh, amount of marine processes affecting the cliffs. If we have a higher tidal range, then we are more likely to see an increase in erosion. We might see erosional landforms such as wave cut notches and wave cut platforms. And the UK is actually affected by a high tidal range. And it's important to remember as well, we've mentioned on the previous slide, that a high tidal range will create powerful currents and they're important for the transfer of sediment. So we're not going to talk about sediment cells or sediment budgets in this video, um, but that's the link there. Tidal range is really important for the that role of actually moving sediment around the system or even out of the system altogether as an output. So finally, uh, is high energy and low energy coastlines. And I don't think anything from here is um, particularly challenging or unexpected. And they read almost like just opposites. Um, so hopefully that's going to help us remember um, these features. Uh, on a high energy coastline, we've essentially got powerful waves and it's where waves are powerful throughout the year. So I've already mentioned southwest England um, and, you know, people liking to go to Cornwall for surfing. And that's because we have those powerful waves due to that very long fetch um, across the Atlantic Ocean. On these high energy coastlines, you're likely to see um, the rate of erosion exceeding the rate of deposition, and that's going to have an impact on what that coastline then looks like, because we are likely to see erosional landforms predominantly, so headlands, cliffs, wave cut platforms, etc. A low energy coastline, these are likely to be our sandy um, and estuarine coasts, and this is where the waves are less powerful where they, there is some sort of shelter um, from large waves. So an example that we often give would be um, Lincolnshire in the east of England. Um, its estuaries and bays form a kind of sheltered landscape where the wave energy cannot, um, cannot impact there. And we would see, you know, unsurprisingly, uh, the rates of deposition would exceed the rate of erosion on these low energy coastlines um, and then we would see depositional landforms such as beaches and spits. So just to recap, we've looked through the following sources of energy in coastal environments in our quick video. Um, if you want to do some more reading and research about currents, there's a really good uh, TED video on global currents um, that I'll put in the, uh, the notes bit, the link in there if you want to have a little look. Um, and just to finish, just to think about kind of how we might actually use some of this uh, information, I think it's really important that we are aware of these sources of energy and then it will link to the uh, what we learn about landforms and the impacts on coastal landscapes. We might be asked to do something like assess the importance of different sources of energy in the creation of coastal landscapes. So obviously for that, we're going to need the landform knowledge, which we will learn. Um, but we will also need that kind of background knowledge, how the sources of energy, like the ones in the video, um, actually create the energy to have the, the impact on the environment. We also might be asked for specific things, perhaps about tides, um, like spring and neap tides, um, or perhaps the, the characteristics of the different types of waves. Um, so really important that the knowledge in this video uh, is well revised.